Welcome to Electro Online. In this video, we're going to talk about the dark dust clouds and bog globules. So what are they? Well, they are what we call molecular clouds. And the name molecular cloud should give us some insight into that we're just not looking at gas alone, but that it's intermixed with other small dust particles. And if there's nothing nearby, that like a large blue star that shines a lot of UV radiation into the nebula, or if there's nothing inside the nebula that will, of course, then shine uh, within the nebula that causes the electrons in the molecules and in the gas to be excited, well, if there's no emission from these nebulas, then they simply appear as very dark regions in our galaxy. And therefore, because they're dark, they're not that easy to find unless there's something very bright behind it. So here's some examples of these types of nebulas. So here we have what we call a Bach globule, named after the Dutch-American astronomist Bart, Bart Bach. And these are just simply small regions within our galaxy, relatively nearby, where there's some bright areas behind it. In this case, a, an enormous number of stars behind it, so you can see the dark nebula in front of that light. If that nebula wasn't there, the whole picture would just be filled with stars like that. It just simply does not allow the light of the stars to go through it. You can see the reddening of the starlight on the edges of the bar globule, globule, and then in the, in the middle, of course, there's no light coming through it at all. We call it the extinction of the light. Here's another very famous little nebula. This is called the Keyhole Nebula, because it looks just like an old-fashioned keyhole. But again, the only reason why you can see it is because you have this bright reflection nebula behind it. Here's another couple of pictures of these Bach globules, and there's many of those throughout the nearby region. Now, because they're so hard to see, and if, if they're farther away, the dust and the gas that, that's between us and those nebulas obscures them, we can only see them out to a distance of about two to 3,000 light years. But within that region, within that volume, with a radius of about two or 3,000 light years, we can see quite a few of those. Notice that they're typically found within the galactic disk. That's because that's where most, much of the interstellar uh, material is at, and we find it in regions where it's compacted and also where it's intermixed with other dust particles. And so we cannot see them, as we can indicate, out to a distance beyond two or 3,000 light years. They tend to congregate, congregate along the edges of the spiral arms within the disk. And the reason is that's because that's where we have these compression regions, and the compression regions pushes the dust and the gas together, forming these dense regions. And that's indeed what they are. They tend to be fairly dense. They have masses anywhere from a few solar masses to potentially several hundred solar masses. And the size of them is usually less than a light year across, so as much as 100 to 200 light years across. So those are typical sizes. They tend to be rather small, generally, generally just 10 or 20 solar masses over a range of about one or two or three light years. So the smallest, indeed, are called the Bach globules. They're just these small little dense blobs of darkness usually lighted up from behind by something very bright so they, they show up very clearly like that. They're typically about a light year across and typically about 1 to 20 times the mass of the Sun and lately because of the advent of sending telescopes up in space these things can be most easily recognized and seen kind of in a way through infrared astronomy to infra infrared telescopes of course they need to be put up into space uh, one of the famous ones are, is the IRIS telescope that was the infrared uh, astronomical, astronomical satellite back in the 1980s and then the Spitzer telescope about 20 years later who took a lot of uh, images of the nearby space in infrared to get more uh, information about these dust regions in space after all these dust regions of course are filled with the kind of material that could potentially uh, build up new Earth-like planets that may have the material that could be used for life in the dust that's contained within them. There may be a lot of carbonaceous material in them. So we're very interested in learning more about them. And of course, since they're hard to find and since they're obscured and not lighted up, it's kind of difficult to get more information about them. But again, that's why we have those telescopes up in space to get a closer look at these dark dust clouds and Bach globules. So are they just clouds? Well, they are uh, 
They're like nebulas, but smaller nebulas and mostly filled in with other materials. So nebulas typically have just gas in them and not a lot of dust material. These tend to have a little bit more dust material in them and they're not anywhere near uh, bright stars that could light them up. So otherwise they might light up just like any other uh, emission nebula. So why does the dust, uh, the, um, not the dust, the gas ones light up? Why does the gas light up? The gas lights up because if there's a star nearby that emits uh, not infrared but uh, UV radiation, which is very high energy radiation, when that radiation hits the electrons in the gas, it sends electrons up to higher orbits and as they then bounce back down to lower orbits, they give off specific wavelength light that we can easily recognize. Those are called emission nebulas. So if you stick a star, a bright star inside one of those globules, potentially it could begin to glow. Not because, actually, yes, because the same reason as the gas glows. It's for the very same reason. The gas nebulas glow because bright stars nearby or within them light them up. Yeah, they light them up, but it's because of the electrons being, uh, being sent out. But this is more because that more of a physical presence, so you shine on it like a moon, reflects light. So does it, does it reflect light? There's two kinds of bright nebulas. One of them is because they reflect light, and the other one is because they light up because the electrons jump to higher levels. The vast majority of bright nebulas are the type where the electrons jump to higher levels and fall back down and give off specific emission lines. That's what we'd expect to see in these dark nebulas if there was a bright star inside to make it shine. So the bright star makes them shine not because of the starlight, but because the UV radiation causing the electrons to jump to higher levels and as they fall back to lower levels the, they will emit wavelengths of visible light at very specific colors and very specific wavelengths and those are called the emission lines that we would see. And then why do they call it dust? The dust seems more like just little pieces of um, rocks or... Uh, yes, matter. yes, you're right. So why do they call these dust clouds? Because these particular dark clouds contain a high percentage, much higher than typical uh, gas clouds, of dust particles. So these are actually dust particles, which are, they contain, each particle contains thousands, millions, billions of atoms joined together, and, and so they, they're infused within the gas clouds. <laughs> They're little pieces of dust. They're not your typical dust bunnies that you pick up off the corners of your room uh, after, you, you know, after you sweep it up. Uh, here we're talking about dust particles which are of the order of several hundred nanometers. They're of the order of the size of a, of a wavelength of visible light. And so they contain thousands of atoms joined together. So these are small little particles of material typically containing carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, silicon and potentially even metals. So they just gather around in a little group for whatever reason? So do they gather around in groups for reasons? That's a good question. So it turns out where did these types of materials come from? From supernova explosions. So if in the neighborhood over the last so many hundreds of millions of billions of years, we had a supernova explosion that produced all these materials that would then get caught up in the nebulas. They kind of would get stuck in there and they would then become part of these nebulas. And so that's pretty well what we'd expect to happen. Whenever you have supernova explosions, we have this material that gets pushed out, all the various elements on the periodic table. They electrically, chemically join together into small little particles and form dust particles and they get infused into the clouds. Then if a cloud like that produces a star and a solar system, that's where you expect to see planetary, not planetary nebulas, but that's where you see uh, stars and solar systems with Earth-like planets or at least terrestrial type planets. So they, keep, they stay in a little group because of the, the gravitational attraction or why don't they just like <laughs> Do they stay in the group because of gravitational attraction? You're actually kind of right on that one. So part of it is when you have a cloud of dust and gas, there is a gravitational attraction. There's a certain amount of balance between the gravitational attraction and then the buildup of pressure starting to push back. So gas clouds and dust clouds tend to kind of hang together because of gravitational attraction. 
They also t tend to hang together because of the friction that they form. Even though you know it's not as tightly grouped as you would expect, it's very rarefied. There's still motion in there and these things tend to bounce against each other and as they bounce against each other they tend to electrically join into larger and larger little particles and that's where the dust particles come from and that then tends to form a drag right because once dust particles of any sort of size form then light would kind of bounce up against it and they would kind of be stuck in that particular region gas gas molecules light other dust particles would bounce against them and kind of congregate together so they're by pressure and by electrical attraction, by gravitational attraction, you would expect them to kind of band together. And they're just mostly in the, the arms. And they're mostly in the arms, exactly. Yeah. Um, the reason why you wouldn't find things like that in the central bulge is because there's just not a lot of uh, old material left over from supernova explosions. That happens mostly in the arms.